Um, this evening we will be beginning uh, our examination of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Um, and while you're turning there, would you please, again, turn your hearts to the Lord in prayer with me. Father God, we thank you for the freedom, the privilege, the opportunity that we have this evening to gather together to hear from your word, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, uh, this, this night our, our hearts hurt for those who aren't with us. I mean, we, know, we know what prevents them from, from being here. Um, for many, it's holiday traveling and families visiting or being visited and hospitality for for Danny and Kat it's, it's their sick daughter Lord we ask that you would grant quick healing to Juliana that tomorrow morning she would be uh, as right as rain Lord that you would demonstrate your love your grace and your provision for the Restrepo's even tonight. Um, Father, as, as we uh, here on Christmas Eve, uh, there's so many opportunities for stress over these holidays. Father, we ask that uh, we would always remember that Christmas is about Christ that we wouldn't get distracted by, by anything else, that in everything we do and, and say and celebrate tonight and, and tomorrow and, and any other time with any other people, that you would be glorified in it. Father, we ask you to be glorified now, tonight, as we preach your word. We ask that your spirit would work powerfully through your word and that your word would be implanted in our hearts, that we would understand it and that we would do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the day of Pentecost here in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit has descended upon the 120 believers gathered together. Uh, flames or tongues of fire have sat upon these believers, and they've begun speaking different languages, and, and people from all over the Roman Empire each hear them speaking in their own native language, and some are amazed and perplexed as they hear the mighty works of God proclaimed in their own language. Others are mocking, saying, oh, these men are drunk on new wine. And in this mixed crowd of mockers and wonderers, Peter stands up and begins to preach. We begin by reading his sermon. Acts 2.14 But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. One a teacher commenting on this passage made the point that, well, Peter's sermon here, you know, it only lasted about two and a half minutes, so we should preach much shorter sermons. Um, they neglect verse 40, it says, and with many other words he exhorted them. So I feel free to go beyond two or three or five minutes. Tonight, um, we're actually just going to be looking at verses 14 through 21. Verses 14 through 21. But it's important as we begin that we understand what's happening here on the day of Pentecost. We're all familiar with the Pentecostal church, maybe to a greater or lesser degree, but, but we drive past Pentecostal churches all the time. Pentecostalism is the fastest growing subset of what's called Christianity, um, especially in Africa and much of China, as you, you hear about the church exploding in the global south, much of that growth is Pentecostal or charismatic growth. Um, as you drive around the Metro East, you will find apostolic or Pentecostal churches all over the place. Um, saw one just today on the highway, it was, it was called um, called the upper room. You're supposed to come experience the, the upper room elevation at, at this church. Well, Pentecostalism is, is, is big on feeling and emotion and what they believe to be displays of the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the New Apostolic Reformation is, is the most extreme version of this, um, down to the Assemblies of God, which would be the most conservative form of this Pentecostalism. But all of these churches are, are big on, on experience and big on signs. You're supposed to feel things as you go to church, and they're very little on expository preaching. But as we look at this sermon, what we just read, all right, it took three minutes, maybe, to read through this entire sermon, and the comments about what happened afterwards. 
And Peter's quoting Joel, and he's quoting Psalm 16, and he's quoting Psalm 110. He's already got three references to the Old Testament in less than three minutes of speaking. Pentecostal preaching is expository preaching. It takes the text of Scripture and it applies it to the people in the light of Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit empowers the apostles to do. It's to rightly apply the words of Scripture. Paul Washer spoken of, of all these names, all these words, these good biblical Christian words that have really been taken away from biblical Christianity by other groups. Catholic is a beautiful word referring to the universality of the church and it's it's been claimed by Roman Catholics. So Brother Paul would say that you know whenever somebody talks to him and says, Well I'm Catholic, he would always respond, Well me too, I'm a part of the universal church. Let me tell you about our Savior. When somebody says that they're charismatic, he'd say, Me too, I've received the, the gifts and the grace of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you about him. Whenever somebody would say, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, he said, I'm a witness to Jehovah too. Let me tell you about the real Jehovah. We should respond this way with, with Pentecostalism. To be truly Pentecostal is, is not to have these extravagant signs. It's to allow the Spirit to work faithfully through the preaching of His Word. That's what we see here in Peter's Pentecostal sermon. So, as the people are mocking these believers, again, they're, they're hearing them speaking in all these different languages, and they mock. These men are filled with new wine. Peter stands up, he defends them, he, he calls attention to himself. Men of Judea, all you who are dwelling in Jerusalem, listen to me. Let this be known to you. We, these people, are not drunk. Rather, this is the fulfillment of what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he quotes at length Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. They, of course, weren't numbered that way, as Peter was quoting them. It's just the prophet Joel. We're going to read it again. Uh, verses 17 to 21. This is very nearly verbatim what's written in Joel chapter 2. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The people should understand this outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the fulfillment of what Joel has uttered. Joel is the only minor prophet that we really can't place accurately in, in the timeline. There's not enough external detail. He, he doesn't make an explicit enough reference to any other group of people for us to tell whether this was happened, whether his prophecy was made in the 700s or 1,000 or 500 or we, 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 don't, we don't know when Joel was prophesying. But he was prophesying about an event that would occur shortly after his prophecy, but that prophecy, that event was a foretype of what would happen in the days of Christ, what would happen in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and then what would happen ultimately at the second coming of Christ. All these things leading forward to the day of the Lord, the great and magnificent day. The people needed to be reminded that God is working His will 
in history. The world's not just following this aimless course to nowhere. We're not meandering through history. God is bringing his great and magnificent day. God is glorifying himself in salvation through judgment. We've seen it again and again through the book of Judges. The people sin. They're handed over to their enemies. They call upon the Lord and he delivers them through the hands of Othniel or Ehud or Gideon or Jephthah or Samson. We see it throughout the rest of the history of Israel. They sin. They're defeated by the Philistines. And then Saul and David deliver them from the Philistines. They sin, and they're handed over to the Babylonians for 70 years. And, and then, this time, God doesn't raise up a deliverer from Israel to save them. He raises up a Persian king, Cyrus, who just decides. He doesn't just decide. God compels him. To decide, he wants the Jews to, to, to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. There's this continual cycle of judgment and deliverance. And in the year 70, less than 40 years from the preaching of this sermon, the city of Jerusalem is, is utterly destroyed. The, the, the world has never seen devastation like what the Romans did to this city in 70 AD. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Tens of thousands of them were crucified on all the roads leading into the city. The temple was completely demolished. Most of the buildings in Jerusalem were demolished. And for Almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people were, were driven out of their homeland. And Jerusalem still hasn't been completely rebuilt. It, it won't be rebuilt until such time as the temple is, is rebuilt. And it really doesn't seem like that's ever going to happen. But even that, even that devastation is a foretype of the final day of the Lord when Christ comes in judgment. Amos says, Amos chapter 5, he warns those who long for the coming of the Lord. Why do you long for the coming of the Lord? It's a day of gloom and darkness and not light. It's a day like, like if you were running from a lion and you encountered a bear. Or you came into the house and you leaned your hand against the wall and you're bitten by a serpent. That's what the day of the Lord is like. You think it's going to be this great, glorious day for you, and it's not because it's a day of judgment and you are sinners. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of, of blood and fire and smoke and devastation for the vast majority of the world. what we read about in, in Revelation. It, it's the day when the great ones of the earth will call out to the rocks, fall on us and cover us, for we cannot endure the wrath of him who's seated on the throne of the Lamb. It's the... We're in the, the last stage of history. There's, there's nothing else in God's plan of history that, that comes between where we are now and the second coming of Christ. We're in the last days. And God is carrying out his will even now. He's building his kingdom here on earth. Earth, he's preparing a people for this great and magnificent day of his judgment. So what, what will it be in these last days? 
We got first, verse 17, God declares, blessed is, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. On all flesh. That the Jewish people were so centered in their conviction that they alone were the people of God. They alone had the temple of the Lord. They alone had the Holy of Holies. God dwells here. God is with us. He is not with you. But in these last days, remember, at the crucifixion, the curtain separating the Holy of Holies was already torn. And soon the temple is going to be destroyed. God's no longer going to dwell in this temple in the midst of Jerusalem. His spirit will be poured out on all flesh, Jew and Gentile, European and African and Asian and American. On all flesh, God's spirit will be poured out. He will be richly given to people from every background, every situation. God's kingdom expands far beyond ethnic Israel to the ends of the earth. Because as God's spirit is poured out, it's what we see, it's what we read in John 3. People being born of the spirit and of water. People being enabled. People being caused to believe and enter into the kingdom of God. People with the law of God written on the flesh of their hearts. People who love God and love His law and desire to do His will. It's what we, we see as Peter, in a few chapters in Acts, goes to the house of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. He sees, after the preaching of the word, that they too receive the Holy Spirit. It's no longer restricted to Gentiles. It's, it's gone to all the peoples of the earth. And ultimately, there's coming a day where God's Spirit will not just be upon all flesh in, in the sense of being on all types of people, but be on every person without exception. If you read the end of the book of Revelation, after the great battle on the last day, when everyone appears before the judgment seat of Christ, Everyone ends up in, in one of two places. Either your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you enter into the paradise of, of God, or your name's not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're thrown into the lake of fire. So in that, the last day, the only people outside of the lake of fire will be those who have God's Spirit poured out upon them. Everyone without exception will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But in these last days, leading forward to the last day, this Holy Spirit works among us. Halfway through verse 17, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. See here, that it's not just that the spirit's going out to Jew and Gentile, people from all parts of the world, but to all peoples in these ethnic groups, sons and daughters, young and old, even the servants, the slaves, are having the Spirit poured out upon them. They shall prophesy, they shall see visions, they shall dream dreams. In the early days of, of the church, um, we, we read just on Wednesday about Anna, who was a prophetess. Um, Philip's four daughters prophesied. Um, Peter and Paul both see visions and are spoken to by God in dreams. They write the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Agabus was a prophet. And 
there's a question of a really large controversy in the church today over whether those visions and dreams and prophecies continue or whether they have ceased. There's a compelling case to be made that, that they have ceased. Hebrews begins by saying that at various times and in various ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. These visions and dreams were used to establish the church and establish the canon, but, but now he's, he's said that we have the words of Christ. But even without making that case, we, we can still demonstrate conclusively and quickly that the vast majority of what goes on in, in what's called Pentecostalism is, is unbiblical because the Bible gives us instructions for how prophets and dreamers of dreams are to be judged. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, we're told that if anyone comes to you and prophesies something that doesn't come to pass, you're not to listen to him anymore. Don't pay him any attention. He's not a true prophet. He has spoken presumptuously. That, at a conservative estimate, easily eliminates 99.5% of everyone who claims to be a prophet today. Their prophecies don't come to pass. But even if, by some circumstance, someone has prophesied everything correctly so far. We look at Deuteronomy chapter 13. It says that if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams prophesies to you, and what they prophesy do does come to pass, and then they say to you, let's follow other gods, then you know that they're not a prophet of the Lord. They've been sent to you to test you. And you are to cling to the word of the Lord and to his commandments. You're to put this man to death. Anything that any so-called prophet says that contradicts or goes beyond what is given in the word of God is false. It's not to be listened to. They're to be put out of people. These visions, these dreams, these prophecies are all empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we read what the Holy Spirit does in John 14 and John 16. The Holy Spirit convicts the, wor the world through the word of Christ. He bears witness to what Jesus has said. He calls to mind what Jesus has taught. He, he enables his people to declare what Jesus has taught. Taught. Remember, the, the entire message of these people speaking in tongues in verse, um, verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that's poured out upon all flesh is given to declare the mighty works of God. That is the major work of every servant of God, is to declare the mighty works of God. That's, that's the prophecy that's true and in the world today. It, it's not a prediction that next week the stock market's going to go up or go down, so you should invest in gold now. It, it's not that... Russia is going to declare war on who knows whom. So you should stock up on all these emergency rations just to be safe. Prophecy is taking the word of God and declaring it to the people who need to hear it, which is everyone in the world. It's, it's thus saith the Lord. And we are all called in this sense to prophesy, to speak God's word to the people, not from behind a pulpit necessarily, but to the people God brings into our lives. This is what we are called to do.
you know, just um, last Wednesday uh, was R.C. Sproul's funeral. Um, it was attended by, if you're a Christian, it's a big deal. Um, if you've watched the news, it wasn't mentioned at all. R.C. Sproul's apparently not as important as any B-list celebrity. But it was, it was attended by you know, a who's who's list of influential Christians. He's, he's regarded as, as undoubtedly a great Christian teacher, preacher. And we can get into this habit of, of thinking that, you know, well, yeah, he was, he was really great. He was really important. So is John MacArthur and, and Steve Lawson. You know, we have maybe slightly different lists of who these great Christians are. Um, and then we think that, you know, I'm just, I'm a nobody. You know, Al Mohler is not going to fly to St. Louis to come to my funeral if it should happen next week. But remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 7. He said, that truly, I, I said to you, among all those born of women, there has been no one greater than John. But I say to you that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. So think through the Old Testament saints. You've got Joseph, you've got Abraham, you've got Jacob, Noah, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the minor prophets, all these Elijah and Elisha, all these mighty men of God. And Jesus has said that John was greater than all of them, and that you, if you are a Christian, are greater than all of them. Maybe you are, truly, the least Christian who's ever lived. And Jesus says you're still greater and more important than Elijah and Joseph. Because you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Word of God and, and you are a witness to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and His salvation. And you are called to declare this resurrection. Are you being faithful to what God has given you. you. You have the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit so that you can just make lots of money and, and stay out of controversy at the office and buy lots of nice stuff and go on vacations. And you have the Holy Spirit to bear witness to the work of God in your life and in the world. That's what you are here for. You are a servant of God. You're here to do His good work. So use the gifts that He's given you by the Spirit to be about that work. That's what you are here for, however you make your living. That's what you are to live for. They shall prophesy. They shall declare the words of Lord. Verse 19. Now shall wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. We, we can't tell exactly how this was fulfilled in the days of Joel because you know, we, we don't know exactly what judgment he was prophesying about. We, we can't place it exactly. I think that was deliberate on God's part so we didn't get too caught up with Joel. We can focus on how it was fulfilled in Christ and how it will be fulfilled in the future. In the life of Christ, we saw wonders in the heavens above as he was born. An angelic choir announces his birth to shepherds in a field. A star shines over his manger, his, his cradle. 
until the wise men come to him. As he's baptized, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And with signs on the earth below, we, we read about three of them this morning as he cast a legion of demons out of a man in garrison, as he cured a, a woman of a discharge of blood that had lasted for 12 years, and as he raised a little girl from the dead. There are so many signs that Jesus performed on the earth that John concludes his gospel by saying that Jesus did so many things that if all of them were written down, I don't think the world could contain the books that would be written. There were a multitude of signs on the earth below. And as Jesus was crucified, the sun turned to darkness. There was an eclipse, the sun in the middle of the day. As Jerusalem was destroyed, there was blood and fire and smoke. And there will be these signs and wonders again on the coming of the last day of the Lord. This great and magnificent day. This isn't told to us that we can try to read the signs and figure out, okay, well, the United States just recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and then that means that there's 72 weeks left until that's, that's not the point. The point is that we're in the last days now, and these things are going to just continue and intensify until the day of the Lord comes. So you need to recognize that the day of the Lord is coming, and that it's closer now than it was when we first believed. And you need to prepare for this day. And how do you prepare for it? You prepare, verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think this verse right here reveals on a human level why Christianity is so unpopular with the world. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And when we take saved out of its church religious context, we can bring it to what the world means when, when you hear saved. I mean, it's, it's rescued, delivered out of danger. Nobody ever wants to admit that they need saving, right? I'm, I'll confess of a, a few remarks on this just Wednesday, of a contrary spirit. Um, when, whenever I hear about natural disasters coming, um, you know, my, my first thought, you know, if I was living in Houston and I hear that Hurricane Harvey is coming, it's okay, it's a good time to get out of Houston. But then as soon as the city says there's a mandatory evacuation and you have to leave, then my spirit goes, no, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay right here. This is my house. You can't force me to leave. I, when I was in seminary, I made a small, it wasn't a scene really, but I was definitely rumbling. There was a tornado in Louisville um, while I was in class, so they canceled classes and made everybody go uh, into the, the locker rooms, which is you know, the, the safest part of the building. I'm grumbling the, the entire way. Aren't we, aren't we Calvinists? Don't we believe in the sovereignty of God? I want to stay in class. And if a hurricane or tornado you know, strikes the building, then that was God's will. I want to stay, want to stay here. Uh, I don't want to admit or confess that there might be something outside of my power to persevere, something that I might need to be rescued out of. None of us want to have to be Rescued. We want to be the hero who rescues somebody else or who delivers ourselves by our own strength. 
Christianity does not allow for that. There, there's no path to self-exaltation. There's, there's no path that you follow to redeem yourself or earn eternity for yourself. We have to humble ourselves and accept and admit that we need God to rescue us. And what do we need to be rescued from? Ultimately, essentially, we need to be rescued from the wrath of God. There's other things we, we need to be delivered from. We, we need deliverance from sin, from the power of Satan, from the domain of, of darkness. But all of those things are, in a sense, incidental to the reality that they expose us to the wrath of God. Um, there's a movie that I watched at least half a dozen times as a child. We had it on, on VCR. I believe it was called Castaway. Um, it was set in the, in the good old days of sailing when the ships were wood and the, the men were, were iron. Um, it's about a young boy who becomes a mate on a, on a ship. Um, and on the first journey, they, the sailors catch a girl who's stowed away on board and they, they lock her in the shipwreck. Um, thank you, parents. Um, the, the girl's locked in the hold below decks. Um, she's a stowaway and they're going to kick her off the ship in the next port. Um, but while she's locked down there, there's a storm at sea and the ship starts to sink and she needs to be rescued from the hold, not because the chains are going to kill her directly, but because she's, she's stuck there and water is pouring into the ship. It's the water that's going to kill her. She needs to be free from her chains so that she can escape the water. We need to be free from our sin because our sin brings upon us the wrath of God. We need to be freed from the power of Satan because Satan and all those who belong to him are going to be thrown into the lake of fire by God. Ultimately, we are not to fear anything in this world but him who is able to destroy both our body and our soul in hell. We are saved by God, from God, for God. He's the one that we're rescued from. And that's why the cross was essential. It wasn't necessary for Jesus to die to have power to o over Satan and demons. It wasn't necessary for Jesus to die to gain power over death. He was already raising the dead before his resurrection. He was already casting out demons before he was crucified. He, he was already saying, your sins are forgiven before he was crucified crucified. The crucifixion was, was necessary for Jesus to take the wrath of the Father upon himself so that he could bear the penalty for those sins, that we could receive his righteousness and so be treated as though we were the righteousness of Christ, because we have become the righteousness of Christ. He has done all the work. He's absorbed the Father's wrath. We can be saved. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we... We shouldn't have any reserva reservations about that verse. This church, I believe, is biblical in its soteriology, its, its understanding of salvation. Um, we're, we're called by others Calvinists or Reformed or, um, as Brandon said this morning, sovereign grace. We believe God is sovereign over salvation, but we can still say at the same time, with absolute conviction and confidence, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. 
We're, we're so-called Calvinists not because we found a system that we like and we think we can cram everything in the Bible into that system and cut off the parts that don't fit. We're called Calvinists because we believe it rightly encompasses everything in the Bible, which Arminianism cannot do. The, the greatest Arminian preacher in history was undoubtedly John Wesley. And Wesley preached a sermon against Calvinism where he, he was forced to say, you know, these verses, I, I can't tell you what they mean. They have to mean nothing, because if they mean what the Calvinists say, they mean it makes God worse than the devil. So we just we have to say, I, I don't have any idea what these verses mean about nobody able to come to God unless the Father calls him, or about God having the right to do whatever he wants with vessels that he has made. Arminianism cannot take everything in Scripture and put it together into a coherent system. Calvinism does. We can say everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no one who will appear before the judgment seat of Christ with a true faith in Christ, with a true hatred of their sin, with, with a true dependence upon Christ to whom God will say, Sorry, you did all the right things, but you were not one of the elect, so you get kicked out. Rather, what we say biblically is what Paul said, quoting Isaiah, that God is holding out his hands all day long to a stiff-necked and contrary people. He said that God is far more willing to save you than you are to be saved. We're the people ignoring the mandatory evacuation order. We're the people who you know, see the Coast Guard, the National Guard, or whomever coming to rescue us. And we head in the opposite direction because we don't want to be rescued. We love our sin, and we hate God. Unless God so works upon us, that our heart of stone is removed and a heart of flesh is given when we are born again. And God enables us to call upon him because he has first called us. Verse 39, I know it's distant from our text, but it's still part of the same sermon. Peter says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And actually, if you look at Joel 2.33, um, you'll, you'll see the same thing, the remnant, those whom God has called are those who are saved. They call upon the name of the Lord because the Lord has called them to himself. He's made them able and willing to call upon him. But the significance of this for us tonight is that our appeal to people as good, reformed, sovereign grace Baptists should, should not be to tell people, you know, well, you just need to hope that you're one of the elect. And if you are, then everything will be all right. We tell people, call upon the name of the Lord. If you desire to be saved, if you've come to a place of hating your sin, of, of being cut to the heart, and realizing that you need salvation, call upon the name of the Lord. Trust Him. Trust His work. Repent of your sin and you shall be saved. This is the message that we have to proclaim. Will we be about proclaiming it? If not, 
what are we doing here? Paul writes about widows in 1 Timothy 5. And this does have a point. I know no one here is widowed. But it says that you know, those who are truly widows, left all alone, have set their hope on God and continue in supplication and prayer night and day. But those who are self-indulgent are dead even while they live. There are so many people living self-indulgent lives who, who live for their television and their entertainment and they're, they're amusing themselves to death and they're, they're already dead and they just haven't realized it yet. That's not what we're called to be. We've been given gifts. Remember the parable of the talents. Maybe God has given someone else more talents than you, but he's given you gifts. He's, he's given you money. He's given you responsibilities. He's given you the gifts of the Holy Spirit to use for his sake. Don't be the manager who digs a hole in the ground and buries the money and when God comes back and says, well, here's, here's everything that you gave me in the first place. I haven't lost any of it. I haven't done anything with it either. But, but it's all still right here. That does not please the Lord. Don't be those who say, well, here's, here's the money you gave me and I spent it all on myself. I bought myself a really nice house and a nice car. Had a good time with it. Thank you. That's not what you have these gifts for. You have it to use for God's sake, to declare this message, this hope of salvation, this glorious gospel of the blessed God. Tomorrow, as we celebrate Christmas, let's proclaim the risen Christ. When we go back to work, when we go back to school, when, when we go back to whatever it is that we do, as we meet other people, let's proclaim this gospel. A really simple thing we could do, this is the most direct application I think I will ever give in a sermon, um, we, we have Facebook. Yeah, I don't know if you're on Facebook and just have a friend in me or if you just let your wife do it. But you know, we, there, there's this giant social media platform that, I mean, within you know, seven degrees of separation, you're, you're connected to almost everybody else in the world, except for Andrew. Hmm. And, you know, these sermons and these scripture readings get posted to Facebook every week, there's a link to the YouTube video, and, and it take, would take all of about 10 seconds, maybe, to find the page, find the video, click like, and share, and, and just push the sermons out into social media. And some people will just go right past it, and some people will look at it and sigh and say, well, there's so-and-so always pushing their religion on us. But somebody, people spend a lot of time on Facebook. They're bored. They, they might click play, and they might get interested, and God might be calling them to himself. And it's a really simple really easy way to share the gospel to share the proclamation of God's word if, if my sermons aren't good enough we've got some from Brandon if neither of us are good enough then go share sermons from John MacArthur or somebody and talk to us about why our sermons aren't good enough it's an easy way to share the gospel 
That's what we are here for. That's what the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us for. These are the last days. This is what we should live for. For the glory of God. So this might have been longer than Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Well, let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you for the work of your spirit in convicting us and comforting us and in strengthening us. Father, we ask that you would continue to pour out your spirit upon us, that we would be faithful stewards of everything you have entrusted to us, of every relationship, of every talent, of every opportunity. Lord, we know that the last day is coming. When you come, may you find us faithful on the earth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.